to give the inaugural Linda Whetstone Toast to Freedom, let's welcome to our stage one of Linda's very accomplished daughters, of course, a granddaughter of the man who founded Atlas Network, the IEA, Manhattan Institute, and more, Sir Anthony Fisher. What a privilege it is to have with us Rachel Whetstone. I'm a little bit nervous up here today. Her funeral and memorial seem less scary, but I can feel her up there somewhere saying, go for it, girl. <laughs> it's such... <laughs> it's such a tremendous honor to be here with you all and to give this toast to freedom tonight on what would have been Linda's 80th birthday. My father, Francis, my sister, Kate, my nieces, Lucy and Alice, we were all so touched by the four tributes you gave last night. And our family is so grateful for the love and support Stephanie and Brad, as well as the broader Atlas family, have given us since her death. As many of you know, Linda wasn't one for long speeches or highfalutin theories. She was very practical and came from the, oh, just get on with it, School of Management. I was reminded of this last week while re-watching an old interview she did with Madsen Piri at the Adam Smith Institute. He asked, what's your strongest argument for freedom? After a long pause, which was very unusual for my mother, <laughs> she replied quite quickly, well, I think we just need to stop talking about freedom. It only leads to a long debate about what freedom means when people really need practical solutions to their problems. So Brad, I think we're barking up the wrong tree tonight with this toast. Now, Linda learned about freedom at a very early age, but not necessarily in the way that many of you imagine. Her father, Anthony Fisher, was a very laissez-faire parent. There were few rules, and he never disciplined his children, much to the irritation of his wife, Eve. So they were free to do pretty much as they pleased, and they did. Like sitting on the top of the wardrobe, to avoid being taught by their governess, or Linda being expelled from every school she attended. <laughs> I believe true stories, but she did like to exaggerate. <laughs> However, as a parent, she was rather different. <laughs> I know. Double standards, they're allowed sometimes. Mum set very clear boundaries. And she was never afraid to tell us when we may, failed to meet her high expectations. An experience that's probably not lost on some of you in this room. <laughs> of course, being a supremely practical person, Linda was more interested in freedom as a means to an end than an end in itself. She saw that ordinary people can do extraordinary things if only they have the freedom to do so. And she understood that to flourish, freedom, rather like children, needed structure, the rule of law, and property rights. <laughs> her brilliance, of course, was not so much in these ideas, but rather her remarkable ability to make things happen. Linda had a formula and it worked. I think of it as Agent W's guide to kitchen table freedom fighting. <laughs> Rule number one, ideas matter, but to affect change, you have to get them out into the world. And that takes practical, specific policy, policy solutions to real problems, written in plain language with supporting data and spread widely using the most up-to-date technology. Mont Pelerin Society members take note. 
Rule number two. Right now. Go, go. Rule number two. It takes time and patience to change the intellectual climate of opinion. The Institute of Economic Affairs was going for 20 years before anyone even started to take notice. So if at first you don't succeed, try, try, and try again. Rule three, be generous with your time and others will be too. Because when you're stuck and can't figure a way out, there's usually someone somewhere, maybe Tom Palmer, who's faced the same or a very similar situation. And that's why organizations like Atlas and the Network for Free Society exist. Rule number four, it's a huge responsibility to take other people's money for your own ideas. So always focus on the return on their investment and hold yourself accountable for the outcomes. And finally, rule number five, there's never a final victory in the battle for ideas. So you have to inspire the next generation with a love of liberty too. And of all the things I'm most proud that my mother did, it was her ability to inspire young people. 80 years ago, Anthony Fisher's brother, Basil, was killed during the Battle of Britain. They were flying alongside each other when Basil was shot down in a dogfight over the south of England. He managed to bail out, but his parachute was already on fire, and Anthony watched helplessly as his brother fell to his death. This loss had a profound impact on my grandfather, who dedicated his life to defending the freedom that Basil had died for. Last night, we were all profoundly Last night, we were all profoundly moved by the deaths of five Atlas alumni, four from Ukraine and one from Chad, who gave their lives for freedom too. It's our responsibility, and it's a heavy responsibility, like Antony's before us, to ensure that they did not die in vain. Please join me in raising your glasses to these extraordinary men and to renewing our commitment to the lifelong fight for liberty. Thank you. <laughs> to liberty. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel.